Okay, so tonight, Bezor Hashem, we're going to be continuing and finishing our series of Shirim on hope, on the concept of hope. And tonight we're going to be do some, I'm going to be doing something that I haven't done ever in terms of the Shirim that I've been giving, and is that I'm going to focus on somebody who is not a tzaddik, on a work that is primarily profane or wholly profane, wholly with a W, but this thinker, this poet, this creature who created a world of literature within which he lived is a little bit different than at least what I perceive as the typical literary output of an author who is separate from their work. Franz Kafka, on a certain level, was a homeless individual, a worldless individual, without a place whatsoever, wandering from the beginning of his birth to the end of his very short life. And what it seems to me, in my humble exposure to Kafka's literary world and his secondary writings and his philosophical musings on the secondary literature, which abides, especially within those weak messianic Jewish thinkers who were not within the realm of Torah, but nevertheless desired to be in the world of Torah, as we're going to see, that Franz Kafka created for himself a world in which he could live. Because without his literary universe that Franz Kafka created, there would have been no place for such an individual. Now, Kafka is deeply, deeply Jewish in his writing. That's clear from the autobiographical writings, from the biographical writings, from the writings that he wrote about his relationship with his father, that in his short life of 39, 40 years, Kafka's relationship with his Judaism, with his father, with the things that he identified as powerful in his life, that superego that arranged the order of his life, Kafka had a, a deep kind of love and attraction, but at the same time a repulsion that pushed him away. So that even though Kafka never lived within a space of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism, in any formidable way, Kafka's relationship with leaving Judaism, which he spent his whole life trying to do, untangling himself from those Abrahamic threads of guilt or confusion with regards to what the law might mean, even though Kafka's entire life was spent trying to run away, the fact that he spent his whole life trying to run away from the Torah and trying to run away from the conception of Judaism in its most general sense shows us in a certain negative logic that he spent his whole life in relation to Judaism. That if a person spends their whole life trying to run away from something, trying to denounce something, trying to minimize the value of something, on a certain level, it's the lady doth protest too much and that underneath the negation and underneath the attempt to quiet down those waves within the spirit of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism, that because Kafka spent his whole life fighting against it, it, it reveals a deep bond that Kafka certainly felt. And that's apparent. Kafka himself wrote that if I can define my writing in any way, if I can define my literary project in any way, what I'm trying to do with the pen in my hand, that world that I'm trying to create myself, is a new esoteric doctrine, he writes in a letter to his good friend and scribe Max Broad a new esoteric doctrine which on a certain level is an assault on the border of human capacity. And if I'm using a parable, says Kafka, I would describe this assault on the border of that last human frontier as a movement from below to above in an attempt to re-enter that space of God. And if we're speaking in parables really, says Kafka, then the movement from below to above is nothing other than the movement of God from above to below. Because when we speak in parables, ultimately both sides are true. And he describes the desire to create a new Kabbalah in his own language. But nevertheless, he says, things got in the way and I was incapable of doing it and we're going to see what that might mean. But in Kafka's own mouth, his entire literary project, his entire textual world that he creates for himself is an attempt on a certain level to recreate that esoteric doctrine, that belief that underneath the surface of things, there exists a pulsating heart of Judaism that speaks not only to the ancient and antiquated ideas that are no longer relevant to the soul, 
Lahavdil, according to the mind of that modern thinking. But even for Kafka, that world of Jewish esotericism, the concealment that the Torah invites a person into, bespeaks a value even for this form of subjectivity that Kafka himself was speaking about, which even though many of us don't know what it is, and it's very difficult to put into words, nevertheless, we all also understand that to say that something is Kafkaesque, to say that something is as if it were a Kafka novel, is a mood, is an attitude, is an effective space that each and every individual of our generation understands. Because when a person looks at the world of Kafka, when a person looks at the literary world, that fantasy space created by Kafka, the abiding sense is one of disorder, of powerlessness, of being chased unjustly, a world where law and order, a world where justice, rather, is negated. When a person looks at the novels, when a person looks at the trial, or a person looks at America, or a person looks at the castle, or a person looks at metamorphosis, the general thematic that emerges out of those stories is that at any given moment that a person finds themselves in, at any point in their lives, things can flip from one end to the other. I can go to sleep a human being and wake up a cockroach. I can experience a transition from the world of human matters and human cares and wondering about my egoism and all of the things that keep me up at night. But the next morning I can wake up as a vermin. I can wake up no longer a human being. Parenthetically, this is also very close to things that Jewish mysticism speaks about, that the Kabbalah speaks about, as we're going to see, especially when we speak about Rabbi Nachman. And in the world of the trial is Walter Benjamin, another beautiful, profanely illuminated Jewish spirit, describes in his essays on Franz Kafka in Illuminations that the world of Kafka is a world of being chased without reason. It's a world of faceless bureaucracy, but not bureaucracy in the mundane sense of the word, but bureaucracy in the most generalized form, a feeling that I want to move forward, but there are doors that are blocking me. And when I try and seek out access to how to open those doors, I find myself lost. I find myself pushed away with no apparent reason, fending for myself, trying to figure out what has happened that has cast me outside. What has happened that has damned me and made me feel as if I am already under the fist of judgment without any awareness of what I have done? There's a guilt, there's a, an always already sense of being guilty that abides in the world of Franz Kafka that Benjamin describes as the anxious mode of running around without any idea of what's chasing a person. And when a person reads the, the story, The Trial, it's that bureaucratic space where every level that a person ascends, they confront just another faceless, almost existential bureaucratic necessity that no human logic, that no argumentation holds even a candle to. Because at the end of the day in Kafka's universe, that invisible arm of the law, which is representative according to many commentators of the Torah, of God, of that religion of his youth, of that religion of his family, remains inaccessible. It remains far away. Now, when understanding Kafka, what's remarkable is that because we're speaking on the profane level of things, on the hither side of the tzaddikim, and we're going to explain in a second why we're doing that, another Jewish thinker who was obsessed, intoxicated with Franz Kafka was Gershom Sholem. Now, Gershom Sholem is a difficult person, at least for me to speak about, because I feel many different things when it comes to Gershom Sholem. But one of the things that has always struck me as significant with regards to Sholem is that no matter how Mugushim he was, no matter how much he transposed and forced his own egoisms onto the text that he was studying, thereby clouding any real viable readings that he could have offered, and that in a very real way, the, the chashash, the warning of the mikubalim from previous generations of what can happen when a person learns these studies in the wrong way is that they'll find those poisonous elements of their own egoism, I believe came true in Sholem's work. We also can't deny the value, that light that has emerged out of that space that Gershom Sholem created. 
of the attempt to create an academic world of studying Jewish mysticism, something that at the point when he came to Yerushalayim, at that point there was something that was even scoffed at by religious thinkers. And so far made al tchilaso that no matter what we feel or I feel about Sholem, at the end of the day, when a person looks at the, the world of the academic study of Jewish mysticism nowadays in Eretz Yisrael, it's a renaissance of sorts. It's people with amuna, it's people with a faith in the text, it's people with a deep desire to understand the poetic sensibilities that emerge out of these legalistic and almost arcane texts to try and redeem the value of these texts, something that Rav Kook's Chusei Ganalina would have spoken about in terms of rectifying the mundane and renewing that which was old. So that whatever a person feels of Sholem as the forefather of this chitzonious approach to Pneumia Satora, Sofa made al tchilaso on a certain level where we see that the value outweighs the losses on a certain level, at least Lufianias Daiti. I'm not speaking for anybody but myself. But one of the elements about Sholem is that Sholem, even though he read himself onto the text that he was studying, and on a certain level, as different academics have shown in a redemptive type of way, his understanding of the Arizal and the Svarim was somewhat limited in his exposure. And what he saw in the text he was studying was very much a, a symptom of his own soul, something that another Jew taught us about, Sigmund Freud. Nevertheless, what Sholem did understand, Lafias and the Yasdaiti, is the apophatic impulse at the heart of Jewish mysticism, or what the Leshem would describe as the inability to say anything positive about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Positive in the sense that at the end of the day, we know less about Hashem than we know. And that when a person reaches the apex of their spiritual progress, and a person reaches the apex of the spiritual journey, at the end of the day, at best, what we can say is what we do not know. Because like we've said so often from Lahavdil, Rav Yitzhak Meir Morgenstern and the Leshem and all of the Mekubalim Ha'amitim is that Sof Kol Sof at the end of the day, the holiness of God transcends the holiness of the creation. And no matter how far we ascend on the ladder of spiritual development, we can never, God forbid, claim that we have laid claim to the essence of godliness, so to speak. But rather every attempt that we make to move forward pushes the system even higher so that that infinite gap or that infinitesimal gap between the human being and God will always remain there in a relative sense. That when I hit the ceiling of the level I'm at now, what I reveal right afterwards is that it's simply the floor of a higher level. And this inability to say anything ultimately about what the essence of the infinite is, is something that I feel is very much at the heart of Sholem's writings, something that he saw in German idealism as well. But there are certain writings where a person begins to see the neshama of Sholem, where a person begins to see the soul of Sholem that pulsated through that kind of academic discourse, which attempted on a very real level to negate any valid significance to the text that he was studying. And here, Sholem basically says that if a person feasibly wants to try and understand Kabbalah nowadays, if there's any attempt to understand what Jewish mysticism can say for us, a person first and foremost has to read Kafka. That you can't understand Jewish mysticism without reading Kafka. And Sholem was obsessed with Kafka, in particular the book, The Trial. In particular, that story of Kay, that anonymous individual who one day simply finds himself guilty, who finds himself cast into a world, thrown into a world where things are already working against him. And on a certain level, we could all find ourselves in that space feeling like we're chased by faceless spaces or condemned by anonymous forces in our lives. Each person according to their own heart, each person according to the understanding of their own heart, lives with a feeling as Rabbi Nachman teaches us and as the Kajnitz or Magid teaches us, and really as the Torah teaches us in the beginning of Bereshis, we all feel that on a certain level, we're always already being chased. We're never quite in the right place that we're meant to be. And Kafka spoke from that place. Kafka spoke from a place where everything is deferred. Everything is moved away from its original source, whether it be the product of the Tzimtzum or the Shvira Sakhalim. Everything is removed from its original space. And for Kafka, instead of hoping to move back to our original space on a certain level, there was a sense of hopelessness in the face of having been deferred. But when Sholem read the trial, he writes as follows. 
that nowhere else do we find the Jewish thinker, a Jewish author, a Jewish soul who came as close to the world of Eov, that came as close to the world of describing the experience of Job, of a righteous individual, of somebody who was deserving of God's grace, somebody who was deserving of light in their life. And nevertheless, out of what seems to be divine caprice, chas v'shalom, as Rav Soloveitchik would say, nevertheless, this individual Eo finds himself cast out, a simple man cast out and punished by God, almost a sick trick by the, by the Satan itself, as the Medrash tells us, and the Gemara in Mesech Saita tells us. And the story of Eov is, is not the story of somebody who loses hope in the face of that condemnation that emerges out of nothing other than what seems to be chance, but rather the story of Eov is the story of an individual who is willing to face, to face that chaotic confrontation, to face that impossible face of judgment, that face of HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kav Yachol. And Eov is victorious. Eov is heroic in that sense. Eov is able to move forward and find HaKadosh Baruch Hu again. And it's for this reason, I think, that the person finds in the writings of Hasidus and in the Zohar HaKadosh a profound utilization of the Psukim of Eov, that so many of the fundamentals of Kabbalah emerge out of Sefer Eov. The secrets of the Lav Yasan, the secrets of the Nun Shari Bina, the secrets of Mibasari Echze Eloikai, the secrets of Tzimtzum, as anybody who learns the writings of the Soed Yisharim of Radzin understands, all of the Torahs on Parshas Parashas are rooted in Psukim and Eov, that Eov holds the key to understanding Pnei Torah. But at first glance, the question is, how could it be? Eov is an individual who appears to be suffering servant, a person who is punished with caprice, a person who is punished for no apparent reason in a world that appears to be devoid of judgment, or leis din veleis dayan chas v'shalom that there's no judge and there's no judgment in the world, and that oilam kimin hogonohig. How could it be that we can learn out gufe halachos of primia satora from the world of Eov? But on a certain level, the entire project, the entire purpose of primia satora is to teach us how even in what appears to be injustice, even in what appears to be the opposite of the justice of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, nevertheless, if a person gazes deeply enough into that abyss, into that painful space of injustice and no order whatsoever, that Kafkaesque universe, what a person comes to find is the Hanhaga Yeshera of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That no matter what a person finds that Yashrus, that Neira Alila Al Bnei Adam, like we spoke about in the world of the Leshem Shabbai Vachalayma, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, no matter what, is moving everything in the right way. And Sholem writes as follows when it comes to Kafka. If one can say that prose, in order to be renowned for absolute greatness, must necessarily shed light upon the theological contents of experience in the realm of language, then this book, The Trial, serves as a confirmation of this. After millennia, there has been attained anew, from an unexpected point of view, the linguistic world of expression of the Book of Job. Essentially, this work is without parallel, apart from the Book of Job. The situation of a hidden trial, within the framework of whose rule human life occurs, is developed in these two works at the very highest level. And Sholem continues and he says, the parable, which we're going to look at, the parable at the heart of the trial, which is something called before the law, the parable which describes the guardian of the law is like a kind of summary of Jewish theology, Lahavdil, which in its unique dialectic is not destructive, but on the contrary, radiates a powerful inner melancholy. Here, the true Talmudic thinking breaks its light into a rainbow of colors. What Sholem is describing is something profound. He's saying that at the heart of whatever Kafka is telling us in this parable, which we're going to look at in a moment, what a person can confront is the heart of what the Jewish theological experience is. Namely, that dialectical balance between desiring something so deeply and hoping for something so deeply, yet nevertheless facing the ultimate fact that our hope is not going to carry us anywhere. At least that's how Sholem would see it. And obviously what we're going to show is how through Rabbi Nachman, this whole conception of hopelessness is elevated. The story reads as follows. This is the story, and I'm going to take some time to read it right now, because ultimately it's going to stand at the core of what we're going to be discussing, in the hope of showing that what we discussed last week with Rabbi Nachman was the ability to find hope within hopelessness. 
And that, as Rabbi Nachman teaches us, Ein shum yeish boilam klau. Rabbeinu sha'ag bekol gadol, ein shum yeish boilam klau. That at his death, karuv to his death, what Rabbi Nachman allowed us in on are his thoughts, which tell us that Rabbeinu sha'ag bekol gadol. That even when a person finds themselves in hopelessness, it's of necessity to reveal the concealed, irreducible, and indestructible kernel of hope. But on a certain level, and Refroman points this out when he says that Franz Kafka is simply the pseudonym of Rabbi Nachman on a certain level, is that what Rabbi Nachman couldn't describe, because Rabbi Nachman's faith remained intact. Of course, Rabbi Nachman's faith remained intact. There was never a question of Rabbi Nachman's faith remaining intact. Never. But what Kafka allows Jewish thinking to do is to descend into a place where God is almost completely removed from the scene. There is no God in the writing of Kafka. There is no abiding hope in the writing of Kafka. There is no reason to believe in the indestructible power of the Jewish spirit in the writing of Kafka. It's already post-hopelessness. No tzaddik would talk that way. No tzaddik could go that far. Rabbi Nachman went into the belly of the snake, but Rabbi Nachman couldn't become the snake itself, chas v'shalom. But Kafka, who because he untethered himself and the situatedness of his life untethered him from that space, he was able to speak of a world that was apparently devoid of all order, where it just felt like harsh judgment at all times, where it felt as if at the moment that a person is born, they are cast into already being damned, already being condemned, without knowing why, without knowing who has condemned me, but walking around with a sense of what I do will not work, what I try and fix will not be fixed. Why? I don't know. I just know it to be abundantly true. That is the world of Kafka. That is that darkness, that potentially redeemable darkness of Kafka's universe that we're going to look at. And Kafka writes as follows. Before the law, and the law, again, at least as I want to understand it, as Elliot Wolfson understands it in his writings, Venturing Beyond, as Gamben understands it, as Benjamin understands it, as Sholem understands it, the law represents the concept of the Torah, the concept of a person in relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Before the law stands a doorkeeper. To this doorkeeper, there comes a man from the country, and this man prays for the admittance to the law but the doorkeeper says that he cannot grant admittance at this moment. The man thinks it over and then asks if he will be allowed in later. It's possible, says the doorkeeper, but not at the moment. Since the gate stands open as usual and the doorkeeper steps to one side, the man from the Kumshi stoops to peer through the gateway into the interior. Observing that the doorkeeper laughs and says, if you are so drawn to it, just try and go in despite my veto. But take note, says the doorkeeper. I am powerful, and I am only the least of the doorkeepers. From hall to hall, there is one doorkeeper after another, each more powerful than the last. The third doorkeeper is already so terrible that even I cannot bear to look him in the face. These are difficulties the man from the country has not expected. The law, he thinks, should surely be accessible at all times to everyone. But as he now takes a closer look at the doorkeeper in his fur coat with the big sharp nose and long trim thing black tartar beard, he decides that it is better to wait until he gets permission to enter. The doorkeeper gives him a stool and lets him sit down at one side of the door. There he sits for days and years. He makes many attempts to be admitted and wearies the doorkeeper by his importunity. The doorkeeper frequently has little interviews with him asking him questions about his home and many other things. But the questions are put indifferently, as great lords put them. And they always finish with the statement that he cannot yet be let in. The man who has furnished himself with many things for his journey sacrifices all he has, however valuable, to bribe the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper accepts everything, but always with the remark, I am only taking it from you to keep you from thinking that you have omitted anything. During these many years, the man fixes his attention upon continuously on the doorkeeper. He forgets about the other doorkeepers, and the first one seems to him the sole obstacle preventing access to the law. He curses his bad luck in his early years boldly and loudly. Later, as he grows old, 
he only grumbles to himself. He becomes childish. And since in his year-long contemplation of the doorkeeper, he has come to know even the fleas in his fur collar. He begs the fleas as well to help him in and to change the doorkeeper's mind. At length, his eyesight begins to fail. He does not know whether the world is really darker or whether his eyes are only deceiving him. Yet in his darkness, he is now aware of a radiance that streams inextinguishably from the gateway of the law. Now he has not very long to live. Before he dies, all his experiences in these long years gather themselves in his head to one point, a question he has not yet asked the doorkeeper. He waves him nearer, since he can no longer raise his stiffening body. The doorkeeper has to bend low towards him, for the difference in height between them has altered much to the man's disadvantage. What do you want to know, asks the doorkeeper. You are insatiable. Everyone strives to reach the law, says the man from the country. So how does it happen that for all of these many years, no one but myself has ever begged for admittance? The doorkeeper recognizes that the man has reached his end and to let his failing senses catch the words roars into his ear. No one else could ever be admitted here since this gate was made only for you. I am now going to shut it. Now it's a heartbreaking story. It's, it's, it's an unbearable story. A person spends their whole life hoping for something. A person spends their entire life trying to enter into the interior, whatever that interior might mean, with the belief that hope will carry us through. And ultimately, at the moment of demise, at the moment of expiration, what a person is confronted with is that ultimately, that gate was only for me. That gate was ready for me to enter into. It was mine to enter into. And as the person acknowledges their hopelessness, as a person acknowledges their inability to finally enter in, the gatekeeper tells them that prevention tells them that ultimately this was only for you and now you can't enter in. That all of the hope that we've had, all of the desire that we've had to enter into the inside, to penetrate through those partitions that block us from getting what we want, all of them, like the Baal Shem Tov, would teach us were Nachiz Senayim. But in Kafka's universe, the man from the country dies outside of the door, almost as if shutting an ironclad door on hope, announcing hopelessness. But the matter is not so simple. Writing to Walter Benjamin, his very close friend, Gershom Sholem writes how without the trial, without this parable, you can't understand Panimia Satora. And Walter Benjamin writes back, and Walter Benjamin, who had very little access to any true understanding of, of Yahadus in any real way, he writes, what I find most powerful about Kafka's story is the absence of anything behind the door. There's nothing there. It's empty. There's nothing for a person to behold, chas v'shalom. And that's why he's barred access, because ultimately there's nothing there, there's nothing to truly hope for. And what Sholem writes back to him is profound, and I think this is an area where Sholem was ultimately correct. He says, my dear Walter, my dear friend Walter Benjamin, you're mistaken if you think that behind Kafka's writing there's an absence, that there's nothing there. It's not that there's no law there. It's not that there's no Torah. It's not that there's no God to be held. But rather, what Kafka is announcing is in Sholem's language, the unfulfillability of the law. The impossibility of a person ever feeling that they have completed that process. That's what blocks a person entry. The reason that the door is barred is because if a person were to walk through that door, they would come to feel as if they have culminated their process. And just as in the Torah itself, ultimately the highest level of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and understanding that we can reach is the realization that we don't understand anything, so too in Kafka's universe, Lahavdil, is the realization that if we want to grasp the inside, if we want to grasp the Torah, if we want to understand what is truly at risk and at play in the heart of the Jewish experience, it's learning how to hope and to recognize that our hope cannot be actualized, at least in the present moment. That it is on us to hope. Our hope might be unfulfillable, according to Sholem's understanding of this story, 
But nevertheless, the hope is still real. And so even in a world of hopelessness, even in a world that is devoid of hope, even in a world that for Kafka is devoid of an object that anchors my hope, hope itself is what moves the Jewish experience along. Hope itself is what a push, a pushes a person forward. It's not that there's nothing to hope for, chas v'shalom. It's that what I'm hoping for can't be fully realized in my eyes. There was a while ago where I saw a teaching from the Baal Shem Tov Lahavdil, the Baal Shem Tov Elenu, in Parshas Mishpatim, which I felt was almost like a, a, a biblical text source for the world that Kafka describes for us, for this world of injustice, for this world of punishment without reason, for this world of feeling chased without reason, of hopelessness. And it's based on the famous Zohar in Parshas Mishpatim where it says, Ve'elu mishpatim, ve'elu ha-mishpatim. These are the laws. These are the way that the universe functions. This is the way that Hashem runs the world. Da raza de gilgula. This is the secret of gilgulin, of the fact that a person's life is much older than what they actually assume it to be. Or that my intentions are much deeper in my unconscious than what I assume them to be. Or that my thoughts have miles and miles of unthought behind them. Those are the Gilgulim. The Gilgulim are all of the previous parts of ourselves that we don't acknowledge, that we don't pay attention to, that we're no longer aware of, thinking that they are forgotten and then forcing ourselves to realize that even our present moment decisions are informed by everything that has happened to us from the moment we're born until the moment after 120 that a person passes away. And you want to understand the law in the world. You want to understand that strict justice, that apparent injustice in the world that Eov confronted, that Kafka tried to describe. Then you have to understand the secret of Gilgulim. You have to understand how many modes and experiences inform a person's intentions and their thoughts. The Baal Shem Tov writes as follows, and this is brought down in the Degel Machan Ephraim. These are the laws. This is the law, like we saw in Kafka's short story. This is the law that I've placed in front of you. Isa b'zayar akadosh. It says in the Zayar, Ilin sedurin did Gilgulim. These laws, these are the secrets of Gilgulim, the secrets of the many lives that inform the lives that we live. V'hu tamua lechora. It's a question. Ha pasuk mefarish v'azal dinei mamanos. This pasuk is describing mundane laws of, you know, interpersonal monetary work. Ach shamati, says the Degel, I heard from the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. Binyan hadin, she'echad dan es chavero bebeistin, v'yodeya be'atzmo she'bevadai hu zachai bedin. It's a painful Torah, Chavra. But the mashal is that a person sits in Beistin, and somebody brings them to court, and the person who is brought to court knows in the depths of their heart, in the deepest truth that they could possibly understand, that they're innocent, that they're innocent. They haven't done anything wrong. I know that there's no issue with me. I deserve better in life. But the Torah ultimately, and based in says, even though in your heart of hearts, you know yourself to be innocent. A person shouldn't have kashas on a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Because in truth, the Torah is the path of truth and its pathways are pleasant. Meaning to say that even in the depths of injustice, there's a pleasantness hidden within it. This in and of itself is the sweetness of the Torah. This injustice in and of itself, the fact that you're nitva bedin and you're found chayiv and you're found liable, even though you're innocent, in the depths of your heart, that in and of itself is the darachei adarachei neyam. Ki bevadai mistama haya chayev lechaveiro begilgal ha'avar le'ish hadanimo. Because clearly there are things in your life that you're not aware of. Clearly on a certain level you are liable for something. Uke'eis chayvasa atayro l'shalim le'kadei yitzeis yedei chayvasa. And now the Torah finds you liable and guilty so that you can be redeemed in the future. And the friend that is taking the money from you is someone who also deserved that money from you. And the Baal Shem Tov continues and he says, 
V'yesh loymer sharim is b'zohar hakadosh. This could be the hint of the zohar hakadosh. V'eile hamishpatim. These laws. These justice. Afal pi shemin hanira him lepaimim neged haemes. Even though very often it appears that the judgment in the world is unfair and it's unjust. That these laws, this apparent injustice is rooted in parts of yourself, in parts of your experience that we are unconscious of, that we can't truly understand. That the creator of all things and the creator of all souls. He alone understands what we need in this world. He alone understands what the soul needs. So too, that's how HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs his world. There's a big opening here. When a person begins to realize that the apparent injustice that takes place in a person's world, that those moments of hopelessness, when a person feels that they live in a Kafkaesque universe that is devoid of any anchor of hope, when a person contemplates that injustice that they experience, that sense of being chased, that struggle, that anxiety, whatever it might be, at that moment, a person is capable of drawing down a deeper level of faith, a deeper level of faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu that deeply understands the simple fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world and I have no idea what is going on. That is ultimately where hope will never be lost. Because when I realize that hope is not for anything other than the power of hope, at that point, I begin to draw faith into my experience. Because what else is there to do? Rabbi Nachman writes as follows. Rabbi Nachman writes, and this is brought down in Siach Sarfei Kodesh, in the second Chelek, Rav Shagar made a big Asik out of this. This story, this difficult story, is also brought down in a different way in Kitve Rav Shmuel. He says as follows, Rabbi Nassim writes about Rabbi Nachman. Once upon a time, Rabbeinu was speaking about the concealed ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He was speaking about the hidden ways that Hashem runs the world. Trying to show that there is no knowledge, no wisdom, no mind that is capable of understanding the true ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rabbi Nachman told the story that there was once a very poor Jew who had many children who rented out for three years at a time the Beis HaMerzrach Me'aparetz. He rented out a small space for him and his family from the leader of the town. And he lived there and he got his money from there. And even the non-Jews of the town understood that this person needed so much money that they wouldn't even bother him to collect taxes. And every three years he would renew his contract. Ulam Shana Achas, says Rabbi Nachman, but once upon a time, one year, another Jew came along and he offered more money and he rented that house from that poor individual with his children. And this poor Jew was forced and burdened to leave that place in the middle of the winter, in the heart of the winter with his young children. And this Jew, this Jew who paid more for that place, and kicked this broken Jew out with his children in the middle of the winter. For many years, he didn't have children. But that year when he kicked this poor Jew out and he bought that house, no Ludlo Ben. He had a child. And it was a wonderment. It's not enough that he tortured this poor individual. Even more so, he merited to have children afterwards, something he hadn't merited for his whole life. And Rabbi Nachman ends and he says, This is how Hashem runs his world. And from this we see, that it's impossible to understand the concealed pathways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, above and beyond our capacity to be aware. 
that ultimately living in a Kafkaesque universe where it seems that hope is completely devoid gives birth to a deeper hope that Rabbi Nachman is describing. That even in that place where injustice appears to be so unbearable to look at, nevertheless, it's amuna. It's an amuna that, ah, we have no idea how the world runs. We have no idea. And ultimately, that's what Kafka's world is about, not knowing. Not knowing which way is forward, which way is back, which way is up, which way is down, but nevertheless moving forward. I spent a lot of time talking to my dear friend, Dr. Hillel Broder today, who wrote his dissertation on Kafka. That there's a certain calmness at the heart of Kafka. There's a certain calmness in all of those individuals, all of those tortured souls who run around chased in the world. Really, they don't get mad. They question, they try and save themselves, but they're not mad. They're patient. There's a profound level of patience like this man from the country who waits and waits and waits to finally find entrance into that gate only to find it closed. But there's another way of looking at it, that this patience itself is the redemption of hope. That like we saw from the Rebbe Rashab and we saw from other tzaddikim, that by waiting for something, even though we don't know how it will arrive, what we ultimately find is that our waiting and our hope draws down faith. Kafka writes as follows. He says, we are as forlorn as children lost in the woods. When you stand in front of me and look at me, what do you know of the griefs that are in me and what do I know of yours? And if I were to cast myself down before you and weep and tell you, what more would you know about me than you know about hell when someone tells you it is hot and dreadful? For that reason alone, we human beings ought to stand before one another as reverently and reflectively, as lovingly as we could before the entrance of hell. But Kafka understood, and who was, the other, who was the other person who taught us about the lost children in the woods? In those stories of Rabbi Nachman, those lost children of the beggars who find themselves getting married in the pit, dug into the mud, carried by twigs. When we find ourselves in a world that is sometimes unbearable and we have no way of moving forward, there's nothing left to do but wait and show compassion and love to another person. Because nobody knows what's going on. Ultimately, nobody knows. Da raza de gagula. Guilty, innocent, it's not up to us. It's up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's where the abiding hope comes from. For Kafka, there was a profound promise and patience in waiting. That Kafka writes in his Blue and Black Journals, he said that all human errors stem from impatience. A premature breaking off of a methodical approach an ostensible pining down of an ostensible object. He continues and he says that there are two main sins that human beings have experienced in their lives from which all others derive their being, impatience and carelessness. Impatience got people evicted from Gan Eden and carelessness kept them, from, kept them from making their way back there. Or perhaps says Kafka, there is only one cardinal vice, impatience. Impatience got people evicted from Gan Eden, and impatience kept them from making their way back. We need to wait in front of that gate, even when we're barred access. We need to stand up in the face of hopelessness and announce that our hope is un undying. Kafka writes elsewhere, it isn't necessary for you to leave home. Sit at your desk and listen. Don't even listen, just wait. Don't wait, be still and be alone. The whole world will offer itself to you to be unmasked. It can do no other. It will write before you in ecstasy. Just be quiet and patient, says Kafka. Let evil and unpleasantness pass quietly over you. Do not try to avoid them. On the contrary, observe it carefully. Let active understanding take the place of reflex irritation and you will grow out of your trouble. Men can achieve greatness only by surmounting their own littleness. Patience is the master key to every situation, says Kafka. One must have sympathy for everything, surrender to everything, but at the same time remain patient and forbearing. There is no such thing as bending or breaking. It's a question only of overcoming, which begins with overcoming oneself. This cannot be avoided. To abandon that path is always to break in pieces. One must patiently accept everything and let it grow with oneself. The barriers of the fear-ridden I can only be broken by love. One must, in the dead leaves that rustle around oneself, 
already see the young, fresh garden of spring. Compose oneself in patience and wait. Patience is the only true foundation on which to make one's dreams come true. It was Rabbi Nachman who taught us that the deepest secret of hope, the deepest secret of Kesar itself was Hamtain, to learn how to wait for Yeshua. Umetzapim li Yeshua. Li Yeshua kivisi Hashem. We hope to your salvation, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Umetzapim li Yeshua. And we're waiting and we're anticipating salvation. That hope leads us to learn how to wait properly. Hope leads us to find at that point where that entrance is barred access, to realize like that person from the country, that nevertheless, even though the gate is closed on us, there is a profound illumination that comes into the world as that gate is being closed. Because as the Lubavitcher Rebbe writes when it comes to Ne'ilah, that we so often talk about the closing of the gates on Yom Kippur and this story was written by Kafka a day after going to shul on Yom Kippur with his father. That so often we talk about desiring to enter into the Kodesh HaKadosh and desiring to enter into that place where everything is clear as day, only to realize that those gates are closed. What the Lubavitcher Rebbe Shusha Yogan Aleinu taught us is that yes, the gates are closed. That the day is dying, but those gates close behind us that we're already on the inside. The secret of the law that seems so inaccessible is that the waiting itself is the upholding of the law. That this man from the country died with that bright illumination coming from the inside. That the hope and the waiting sometimes is all that we can do. To end, I want to read a poem that Sholem wrote with a copy of Kafka's The Trial. Have we completely separated from you, O God, in darkness? Shall we no longer be overtaken by any whiff of your peace or your message? Has your voice been so extinguished in the wastes of, in the wastes of Zion? Or has it, not at all, has it not at all penetrated to here to within the kingdom of enchanted illusions? The great deception of the world has already been completed to the very rafters. Allow to awaken, O God, the man who has been severed by your nothingness. Only thus shall your face be revealed, O God, to a generation that has thrown you off. Your nothingness is all that is left for him to experience of you. Only thus does there come to remembrance a teaching which splits the enchantment, a heritage more certain than all of the hidden judgment. We have been weighed on the scales of Job to a hair's breadth. We are disconsolate as on judgment day, without comfort or knowledge. In realms without end, our image is reflected. There is no man who knows all the way. It darkens every eye. The redemption brings no benefit. The, tar is, the star is too far distant. Even should you arrive there, you yourself, your body stands in the way. Yet from the heart of chaos, there sometimes bursts forth a distant light but it cannot show the goal which the law has commanded us. Since then, there stands before our eyes the same melancholy knowledge. Suddenly the veil is rent, O God, from upon your supreme glory. That the waiting itself gives us insight into what we're waiting for, even though that waiting can't be satisfied. Kafka famously said that the Messiah will arrive on the day after the last day. But what that means for us is that that even when a person has fallen away, even from that world that Rabbi Nachman holds a person safe in, the person falls into that mundane space. Nevertheless, there's still a hope that abides, a, a hope in the face of injustice, a hope of that your laws, the justice that you use in this world are a, a deep abyss that my eyes can never penetrate. But at the end of the day, all I have is emunah. All I have is Amuna. To end, Kafka says, we are sinful not because we have eaten from the tree of knowledge, but also because we have not yet eaten from the tree of life. We were cast out of Gan Eden because we ate from the Eitz Hadas Toivara. But we stay out of Gan Eden because we haven't learned to eat from the Eitz Achayim. That Eitz Achayim is the tree of hope. And Be'ezr Sashem, to redeem all of it, what we're going to begin with next week, Be'ezr Sashem, is a world where darkness is no longer even an option. 
We're going to talk about a Yom Shekulo Shabbos. We're going to be beginning to discuss the world of Shabbos, the world of or, the world of light, the world of desire and anticipation that is above any possibility of falling. To reveal to us that even when we feel barred from that gate and we can't access it, in truth, we're already on the inside. Bezras Hashem, we're going to continue next week with beginning the series of Shirim on Shabbos.